to the standard boundaries roundtable. Um, the first thing I'll say is that uh, I asked them for two hours uh, on the schedule, assuming that there might be a lot of things to talk about. I'm hoping it will take far less than two hours and you can get the rest of your day back. Today's supposed to be a really nice day for the typhoon. So, um, yeah, the, the workshop will be kind of like open ended. And at any point, if you feel like you're no longer interested, like don't hesitate to get up and go. Um, that a busy place. Um, but really the intention here was like we've been trying to build uh, you know standard boundaries for a long time and really trying to make it a collaborative effort across different projects in the community rather than it just being like us writing smart contracts. Um, and so to that end we wanted to have a place for people who are using it or projects using it or interested in using it uh, to, to talk about it and, and to share their ideas, their thoughts, problems, issues, um, and kind of thinking about what's, what's next. Um, so just like a quick, quick agenda. Um, I think this is like a generally good flow for how the conversation might go. I'm just going to begin by stating some of like our original intentions behind standard boundaries and why we started building it in the first place. Um, then we'll wa launch into this like group conversation about current issues. I'm sure you guys will have some, some thoughts there. Um, and in general, just like issues we've been seeing. Um, and then finally, better modes of collaboration so that again, it doesn't become like us just writing smart contracts, but we really do want it to be um, this like interoperable and open uh, contract library that, that anybody can use for basic incentives or anything. Um, so the original intentions that we had, uh, when we started building Bounties Network, the first thing that we did was actually write standard bounties. Um, and the reason was kind of these three main points. Um, number one is that we wanted to have this like generalized tool for incentivizing anything. Um, people have been talking about bug bounties for like many years. Uh, people had started talking about code bounties, but um, it became abundant. And, and originally, actually, Bounties Network was uh, a product for bug bounties. Um, but at some point, it became clear that the same mechanism could and therefore should be applied to any type of activity. There's no point in limiting it, um, especially at a contract layer. And that it, what, what really makes more sense is that taking this idea of like tokens and incentives on Ethereum um, and kind of letting people point that towards any type of action they wanted to see. Um, and so to that end, so far, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff like Gitcoins were really popular and of course code, code bounties were made like very, very important. Um, but also we've seen a lot of uh, interesting bounties in like the design space, um, community development, translations, copywriting. Uh, but then also like social impact and uh, people experimenting with like new ways of, of just shaping human action using using bounties and basic incentives. Um, so that's been pretty fun. Um, the next main intention, and this one's like really really important, um, is to have a shared interface for interoperable bounties on, on Ethereum. Um, what I realized pretty early on was like. Uh, if you look at you know marketplaces right now that are like Upwork or Fiverr, you know when someone posts a task and like I call this like a market order for work, um, they have to post it to each of these websites. Um, there's no way, and of course they have their own very like siloed marketplaces. Um, but with Ethereum, we have this idea that we can have this like shared order book across all these platforms. Uh, and this is something that simply wasn't possible before. Um, a, a shared order book that we don't control and you guys don't control, it's like, it's just there for anybody to consume. Uh, and that's a, an incredibly powerful idea and one that uh, really like differentiates what we have with Ethereum from, from these like Web2 technologies where like, we would have to run that. Um, so I think that's something su super important. And then uh, finally, and also really interestingly, and something we're starting to see more of, uh, I think especially in the next year, is gonna be this idea of you know, the composability of our contract, um, specifically that uh, other smart contracts could like programmatically interact with standard bounties, whether it's creating bounties, creating submissions, accepting submissions, contributing, or any of the above. Um, and so those are kind of the three main ideas behind why we started. Um, these kind of have remained generally the same, um, and we've been experimenting with different pieces of them, but, um, you know, it, like I said, it's always the aim has always been for it to be a group effort um, and for other teams to be able to help us towards that end. And so we're excited uh, that we have you guys here who are maybe interested in helping us do that. Um, so with that, uh, I want you we want to launch into our primary discussion. I think that's going to be like the most interesting, which is like current issues we're facing right now. Um, there's been like a number of issues with like some of the assumptions that we had there, especially around the ideas. Um, and so I think it's like worth discussing some of them. Um, I can like initiate the discussion and then if anyone ever has anything they want to say, uh, just like raise your hand or add, hopefully you know, there's not too many people here so we can just kind of like converse in a more natural way. Um, and I'll be taking notes as well and these will end up being published somewhere. I think 
were being reported to. So uh, anyone who wasn't here who maybe argued a little too hard last night uh, can still be part of the conversation. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll start with kind of like the first major issue that I've noticed and that I think like persists to this day, uh, which is around the idea of like the interoperability among different platforms. Um, and this is really hard because like with Bounties in particular, you know there's like different types of action points or features that different platforms will want to add, right? Um, if a, a bug bounty platform might require, you know, users to like perform an additional step, uh, or, or, you know, I know Gitcoin, they added like the idea of like uh, applying for tasks and then you have to get accepted and then you can them. Uh, and then this, this, this poses an issue for uh, this kind of idea of interoperability because uh, those features are often not built in the context of that contract uh, and therefore they can't, those, those actions can't be made on those other platforms. If, if that application feature is built in like a Web2 manner, uh, if that bounty ends up on another platform, Users won't apply, they'll just do the work, um, and of course that ends up being pretty crappy for them. Um, and so one of the challenges that remains is like how do we maintain interoperability as time goes on? Um, and it seems like a lot of that it comes down to like information sharing, uh, but nonetheless it's like something that's like worth noting and discussing because it's like uh, I think a major hindrance to uh, the idea of teams working together. Um, and then the other one that's like also kind of like self-evident, but I, I'll add again, uh, is just that it's like, it remains very much like not in, you know, when you talk about marketplaces sharing those order books, right, it's kind of not in the best interest of any one of those marketplaces to do that. They're incentivized to like maintain their competitive advantage uh, by keeping that data private, right, and that's why all the Web2 companies do that. Um, and so for us right now, like, uh, that's still kind of the incentive of all the marketplaces. Um, and there's a reason why, you know, Bounty Zero X and, and some of the other bounty related platforms on Ethereum uh, haven't used the standard because they don't want to have this open data. Um, and so well, that's one of the challenges we face is like whether it's, you know, relying on intrinsic incentives and having those teams be just like vision aligned that like this is better for our users, we should be doing it, um, or maybe thinking about some extrinsic incentives, it still remains kind of like a, an open problem that's like worth noting and worth sharing with you guys. Um, and if you guys have any ideas of how that might be solved, I'd love to, I'd love to hear that. Um, but yeah, those are my kind of first few problems, uh, the things that are kind of on my mind. Uh, I want to open the floor. Uh, what are the problems, if you guys know about standard values or have used it, uh, like what are the problems you guys are about to Token, 
And I think right now there are, I think, I don't know, like, I don't know if there are ways, like, I haven't fully explored this, but I assume people can still get two types of tokens for completing a task. I don't know, but that's kind of like one of our... So, yeah, to the second question, it's actually really funny. We uh, ran into an issue with, um, with like Web3, uh, like Web3.js, and so basically Solidity had added uh, 2D arrays into, and it was like a, an experimental feature for as part of their um, experimental ABI coder, and uh, neither Web3, like Web3.js didn't use it and, and didn't support it, um, and so we were like, just at the time, just not able to test it when we first launched Standard Minus 2, and so we made this trade-off of whether you could like have multiple people for, per submission, or you could have multiple tokens mm -hmm. for submission, um, and we decided it made more sense to favor the, the yeah. multiple people because collaboration seemed more relevant at the time. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think this is like a really, really valuable uh, uh, like feature and like one we've been thinking a lot. And so I think like yeah, in the future that's going to be huge. Kevin, um, is that something where we could do it where it's not handled in a contract where you have when the bounty is on that trigger something that is I mean, that might be like one way we can solve it within our platform, but I don't really know. Um, we could do that. Yeah. It would just, it, we would have to, I mean, we would have to I mean, modify the token manager further to have like a, a meta control where you have multiple controllers for a job. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, there are ways that we can like customize Aragon to like work around this, but then it's like that's the thing that we're doing. It's like, okay, instead of writing the bounties and contracts in a way that like works with our use cases, like we're doing like all these workarounds. So then the question is, is this the most efficient way for like, us to maintain the contract and meet like our users' uh, demands? And, like, yeah, it kind of like starts to, uh, yeah, it starts standing in the way of our, our user research and our product development. Yeah, and it, I'm sure it takes more time for you guys. But... Yeah. No, I, I totally get it. And... Yeah, it's something that's like, that I don't, is itself an issue, it's like standards take more time and they're like necessarily yeah. more expensive, which like, yeah, so I appreciate you guys continuing to, to support it. Um, and my question with regards to the, the minting tokens, this is something like I haven't spent a ton of time thinking about, so I want to just like talk it through, but the first thing that comes to my mind is with regards to the idea of like the tokens being there and like locked up in the contract. Um, I know one of the reasons this is valuable or like interesting to people is that um, it kind of gives them more guarantees around like, money and the fact that they're going to get it. Um, and even just like psychologically speaking, you know, it's like when, you, when you're at like, a market and you're bartering with somebody, if you like take the money out of your hand and you're holding it in front of them, people are much more likely to be incentivized with that money than if it's like in your wallet still. Um, so I guess like my question is like, how do you think that interplays with the minting idea and is there maybe a way to of like, to do both at the same time, or you know, to to at least ensure that people feel uh, the same levels of like guarantees yeah. about the mintability of the tokens. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it could be considered a like special case for non transferable tokens. Mm -hmm. So if, if a token is non transferable, it doesn't have to be passed to standard values. So standard values would act as a monitor. Yes. I guess the question is though, it's like, it's only, like, I don't know if like, you guys have built an arbitration system in there yet, but it's like, if, unless you have that, there's, there's no way for, if, even if the tokens are in the standard balance contract, I don't think there's any way for the user to get them if you don't have arbitration. So yeah, no, you're right. And, and that would be like a stronger guarantee, which is like, yeah, having a mistake, you both claims a thousand percent. Um, and it's like a much weaker addition of, uh, of like trust, basically, of like trustability, I mean, these better word, but um, in that like, they don't know that their submission's going to get accepted, um, but they can like understand and trust that like at least the issuer has the money. You know, and like whether or not they're yeah, honest yeah. enough to pay is more, like a different question, but at least we know they're like liquid enough to try. Um, and I, yeah, and again, but again, we've never tested that, you know, we've yeah. never tried it, and so I think it might be worth experimenting at least with like the idea of, of um, not having that and seeing that, you know, how much does it change user behavior, how much do they really care about that? Because you're right, ultimately, they, if they don't get paid, like, there's still not really a recourse in the platform like that. So, is, that, is there a plan to add that? <laughs> Yeah, so that's actually a really good uh, segue into, into the, the 
healthy discussion. So just to give you guys some background, um, at some point last year, you know, every time we like talk about bounties and we talk about how it works, people are like, oh, so who accepts submissions? And they say, well, the people who create the bounties are the ones who like act as the oracles and they accept submissions um, because this is kind of the obvious one. Um, and of course, in the contract, you can have uh, anybody now can be an acceptor and you can have an array of them. And so uh, it's like, you know, you can't have third party oracles and you can't have uh, this idea of like, not the issuer or not the creator of a bounty being the one who accepts it, but ultimately it's like an address in a contract. Um, and so enough times people asked us, you know, like, what about if people screw each other over? What are you going to do? Um, and so last year we started building a project that we called Delphi. Um, and the idea is that it would be like a staking project, social staking, um, and the idea that each user might have a stake of tokens that they have locked up, um, and that whenever they interact with different counterparties, uh, that those, in the in the event that they kind of like renege on any of their, their responsibilities, uh, or don't pay people for their work, uh, that they might be able to open claims against each other. Uh, and, and some third party group of arbiters would be kind of voting on, on those claims. Um, we spent a ton, ton of time on it. Um, unfortunately, a couple things happened. One, um, we, you know, the bear market kind of forced us to really focus and, and you know, really buckle down on kind of our core competencies. Um, and two, we kind of realized, like, we're still very early, um, that we didn't have any of these disputes happening on our website to begin with. Um, and so while it was nice for us to kind of know that, like, eventually this is something what it, like, it will look like, um, we didn't need it at the time, and so um, that code is still open source, it's all available if you're curious, um, but nonetheless we kind of like put it on hold yeah. for that moment. Um, what's interesting is as of like a week ago, my motivation to rebuild Delphi has gone up significantly, um, and so like this weekend during the typhoon I'm probably going to rewrite the contracts. Um, just because like, and, and, and I'll give you the kind of background for why, um, a lot of what, what, we've been, what I've been thinking about at least is like with regards to the Ethereum ecosystem, like so many different teams are building these like different puzzle pieces, right? And, like for us, one of the puzzle pieces is bounties and we know that that's like useful. Um, and like Aragon, you know, is DAOs and the different systems there. And, like there's just so many disparate pieces that need to be put together. Um, and we know that like no single team is going to be able to do that and like build all of those pieces and put them together, um, nor should any single team, right? That's like the Facebook approach. That's like why we're doing this in the first place is to have separate teams do it. Um, but it seems like a lot of the issues around getting people to do that uh, are, are kind of based on the idea of like trust, you know, and like and like uh, responsibility and collaboration. Um, and these are social problems. These aren't like, part, you know, you can't write a protocol to do that. You have to like change the way people act. Um, and so to that end, the, the idea I have, and I don't know if this is going to but the idea that I have is that if we could just start having teams and individuals stake on their values and say like, we commit to being a drug, you can take our money if you catch us not doing that. You know, or like, we agree to be collaborative. If we stop being collaborative, again, you can open claims against us. Um, and so just like having us put our money where our mouths are and say like, these are, this is what we stand for and like, we're not just saying it, but you can really hold us accountable for that. Um, and in the hopes that other teams might start doing the same thing and, and that we can maybe lead by example and have um, different teams in the ecosystem kind of all come together and say like, we actually do stand for this and, and not in a way that we're like going to espouse these values but not like walk the walk, but um, in a way that's like trustworthy enough that you can open claims against us and like get a reward, get some more money um, if we don't follow the So um, to that end, I am actually going to be building this soon. Um, and so hopefully you guys will hear about it and, and uh, maybe use it uh, for you because I'm sure you guys have values and you guys want to kind of espouse for the community as well and make sure people can recognize you for so. Um, and yeah, when we have that, hopefully that will remove the need for having standard values contracts and you need to have tokens, right? Um, because then you're just kind of opening claims against, against the DAO itself rather than needing like this contract, yeah. you know, it becomes this like information yeah. sharing layer and like it's some place that's like even like in Aragon, like one aspect of what's being built now is a court, which will have arbitration. But like the way you frame it is, it's like the way the court is going to work. It's like an agreement between two parties, and there has to be like collateral on both sides or something. I don't like. I wish someone that has been working on the court was here. Um, but this way, it's more like these are our values. This is our money. You know, just file claims against us, and that's like much simpler, and it doesn't require the people that are working on the mountains to have the money already. Right. So that's, like, that's one thing that I was like worried about before and how that would work with arbitration because it assumes that maybe both parties need to like put some black on it, which 
Yeah. They don't have yeah. to begin with. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, like, yeah. it's like the primary use case of right. people that are, um, that, like, you know, like, in like, development. You know, like, so that, that's a great thing about bounties. So, you know, people are, like, learning how to code. They want to, like, get into the space. And, you know, it's like, this has a thing where a target user is, like, like the error report might be, like, way too complicated. So that's for, like, crypto projects with, like, you know, millions of dollars or thousands of dollars. Yeah, we So a couple things that you said are very interesting. The first one is actually our original Delphi contracts did kind of require both sides to stake at some point. Like if you wanted to open a claim, you would have to stake and then you would get that money back if your claim was right. Um, but that was a requirement. At this point, I want to see if there's a way to make it like generally sound from a game theory perspective, but at the same time not require counterparties to, to do that. Um, but more importantly, this kind of like new view I have of, of staking is like, it's not an agreement necessarily with like other people, it's like an agreement you have with yourself. Um, and you're asking other people to just hold you accountable for with like what you've already agreed to. Um, the other really interesting thing that I'll talk about, and this actually gets to kind of like uh, the question of like who is going to be the arbiter of these claims, right? Like who is that order? Which is a really, really, really tough problem. Yeah. Um, when we originally were working on Delphi, our idea was that we would use like a TCR of arbiters or, or a plurality, a token curated registry. Um, and the idea is that like uh, you would have a token that could be used by, and token holders would like curate who was token voters. Exactly. Token yeah, yeah. To curate who was um, uh, uh, who is fit to be an arbiter within a certain you know list. Um, we stayed with that for a while, and as time went on, uh, I talked to like Dean Eidemann a lot. He gave me a lot of gripes about why TCR suck, um, and like plutocratic voting is not a good idea. Uh, and eventually, I came around and realized like, yeah, he's right, and that this ultimately is not a very good mechanism. Um, what's interesting is like if you guys know the Claros project, that's kind of what they do. It's not exactly TCR, but it's like token holders are the curators. Um, and I think already from what I've heard, they've been doing a little bit of arbitration around, I, mean, I don't know if it was Uniswap or some other exchange, they're like curating the tokens which can be added to the exchange. And then, yeah. Is it Ethernex? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And um, I've heard there have been some like questionable rulings on their behalf of like which tokens can and can't be added. Um, just because like people are biased and that like you can't get unbiased uh, arbiters that way. Where we ended off when we kind of like sunsetted that research at the moment was actually the idea that, um, so like for us, right, for bounties, most of the claims people would have uh, would be with regards to like a particular bounty. And most bounties are occurring with regards to a particular community. Mm -hmm. And so, and a community in this case yeah. usually is like a town. Yeah. Um, and so the idea that like instead of having like one global arbiter list yeah. for like the entire you know Ethereum ecosystem, rely on the arbiters for that particular yeah. community. And if you don't trust that community to come up with their own arbiters and like do all the stuff and have them rule yeah. claims, you probably shouldn't be part yeah. of that community. You yeah. should just leave and like work it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like kind of like going to an external thing. It's like you're filing a lawsuit, but it's like okay, before you file like a lawsuit, you should like. Figure it out amongst yourselves. Yeah. Like there are steps to how you solve this view. Exactly. Like this might be more you extreme. If you're just constantly forking, you'll never take down a higher. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that we kind of thought about a lot, and this is like, I mean, maybe it was a bit of a rationalization, but we like really like to think this is true, which was that like ultimately, you know, in the context of resolving disputes and like avoiding disputes, right? That instead of just worrying about like, okay, well, we have these disputes and we have to resolve them and we have a stake, whatever. We kind of went like upstream and we're like, well, why do people screw each other over in the first place, right? People, when you go to like stay in an Airbnb versus like when you're staying at your friend's house, you wouldn't trash your friend's house, but people do trash Airbnbs all the time. Um, and most of the time, it's this kind of the strength of the connection between those two parties dictates how much they're going to screw each other over, right? Um, and so a lot of our perspective became, okay, well, instead of assuming there's no connection, instead of assuming there's no trust, what if we could try to like build a platform that actually builds that trust? How do we create human connection among our users uh, rather than like assuming it doesn't exist? Um, and this is like really, really hard and, and, and these are not solved problems. Um, but the closest we've kind of come is like trying to get people to realize that they share a lot of the same values, that they actually have a ton in common. Um, because when you do that, you say, oh, you have kids, oh, I also have a son, like, blah, 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 oh, he plays soccer, so does mine. And, you know, like when you create that connection among people, they, they start to feel guilt. 
Um, and guilt is a much stronger incentive mechanism than any extrinsic tokens or state data or anything like that. Um, and so that's like, I mean, for our platform in the short term, at least that's like what we've been thinking about with solving this is like just getting people to feel bad because, and, and it's worked. Like, we don't really have that many disputes. Like, yeah. if the community it's stays small, like, yeah. But again, yeah. that doesn't scale because you can get about 100 people up right. and trust, and you can't the take out a hierarchy. And this is like, it's funny because at the time, like a year ago almost, we were like, we're not big enough, we don't need this yet, blah, blah, blah. And it's only recently that we started like re-asking this question of like, our, our users are starting to say, you know, like, I'm afraid I'm gonna get scammed because again, they just don't know each other. And so we're starting to think, okay, like, are we back at that point where we need to, you know, where we've grown too big um, for that to still be a fair assumption? Um, my hope is we can still avoid it. Um, a lot of the, the work we're doing these days is instead of trying to have like one global kind of like bounties explorer and like registry of bounties, that, like we're thinking about them within the context of different communities. And so, um, the, the, and, and those communities get to know each other much more um, and making it easier for that to happen. And so that kind of encourages this like tree like style scaling where instead of it just being one group and then having to solve that, you just continuously keep breaking people up into these like smaller groups where they can't know each other. Um, and if you want to so do- So you're talking about a hierarchy? Um, I mean like a hierarchy and like a the semantic sense of information where you have like a parent community which is like graphic design and then like a sub-community which is like illustrations and then a sub-community which is like anime illustrations, you know? And like I guess that's a hierarchy of, of information and um, in some ways does potentially lead to hierarchies of power depending on like the number of people and the decisions they can make. Um, but I, th I think it's like not necessarily that way and like ultimately, in my opinion at least, that kind of tree style scaling is like for computer science, like that's the, that's the way things scale. Um, and so um, that's like the, the perspective I have on this thing. But then yeah. I can see why the hierarchy would be, yeah. Well, what we're working about on Canonizer is, is it's all about consensus. None of what you're talking about matters. Oda's law doesn't matter, organizations don't matter. Nothing matters if you can achieve consensus with everybody. You can overwrite anything. So our focus is finding out concisely and quantitatively what everyone wants and knowing that in real time and be able to track that in a consensus building way. Today, everything finds the disagreement, everything focuses on that, and people fracture and, and, and split into communities. And we can't, as long as we do that, we can't take down hierarchy. But at Canonizer, it's, it's, we have support camps where you have a super camp, which is what people agree on, and when you find something disagreeable, it's usually a minor issue. You push that down to a supporting sub camp. So when you join a camp, it's a wiki with camps, but when you join a camp, you gain editorial control. And if two people want two different things, you push that out of the way of consensus in the supporting sub camp. So everyone still supports the super camp and whatever the reason the focus stays up there. And the bottom line is, is you still need to track all those differences in the lower level sub camps. And by definition, if you know concisely and quantitatively what everyone wants, that's consensus. And if you can know consensus at a scale, you can take that higher. That's really, really interesting. Your project's called Canonizer. Canonizer.com. Dot com. Cool. I'm going to read up on this. This sounds really, really awesome. And I think, yeah, like, is a big problem that I've been thinking about with regards to, like, the values and, you know, like, how do, when you get those disagreements about values, how do you resolve them? And I think that's really awesome, like, pushing them down. To and, and we split the voting and all of that other kind of stuff from the, from the canonization. So when you join a camp, you get control of that camp, so everyone gets a voice, and it's all about consensus, so you have the fewest number of camps possible. But then we have what we call canonizer algorithms that let you canonize things any way you want. So if, today, if, uh, the input is on everything coming in. If you're going to scale, the hierarchy says, we only allow that 1% in, and that's the only thing we're going to publish. The canonizer, we flip that upside down. Everyone uses a canonizer algorithm that's basically a way for you to select the experts that you trust. And you use that canonizer algorithm, it only counts those votes. So you can see 90% of the experts I trust want prog power in the system. And, and, and if you can say that, then no more. The, you have consensus. Yeah, and you have the signaling around like what people think. And, and, and signaling, the current existing signaling is all just about voting and disagreement and a one-time snapshot. Right. In the camps, it's got to be about falsifiability. What will it take? You get the camp to say, what will falsify your camp? You define the experiment, you do the A-B experiment, falsifies that camp, and you measure the value of that 
scientific evidence or argument as to how many people have come births. You can't just signal, you have to measure what people have jumped in camps and why and what it takes. And, and, and again, then the canonizer algorithm, the default is one person, one vote. That's always terrible because the masses are far behind the experts. So you switch to an expert canonizer algorithm and everything reprioritizes. That lets the expert find out what the popular consensus believes right now and why so they can address those issues better and, and amplifies the wisdom of the crowd and gets the, everyone back on board up to track with the experts. So, but but it's all, all the bottom line is, is knowing concisely and quantity. And I, and I believe the first crypto community learns how to communicate concisely and quantitatively so you can know real time what everyone wants and everyone believes. Not only communities, they'll start taking down all the hierarchies. Because hierarchies are always the guy at the top makes the decision and everyone does it, even that, that huge bottleneck. But at Canonizer, you have infinite delegation, so hierarchies form on every single topic, and so there's no more bottleneck. And so you can scale that, finding out what everyone wants, and finally start taking down that hierarchy. That's really, really cool. And I think it's like the interesting thing there, which like the Ethereum community needs to do better, is like, uh, like getting people to realize we all have the same values. Yeah, that like, we agree on, on like 95% yeah. of it. Push the disagreement to lower level stuff exactly. out of the way of consensus. Exactly. And it's like, if we can do that and like continuously remind people that like, we actually agree on almost all of it and like it's only these But you've got to keep track of that disagreement. Too. Right, 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 right. Because, because you've got to get both of what everyone, you've got to find a creative way, whether it's an intersection, you do stoplights, but an overpass, mm. but you've got to track it and know it and monitor it and not abuse the minority guy that wants something different. Right, right, right. Focus right, right. on the little guys. Right. right. And they need to have a say as well. And they have to have their camp and they can't be censored. Have you guys have you guys done any experiments or like thinking at least around like uh, quadratic voting and like yeah, yeah, we're working on an ether algorithm so that people can vote their ether and we're gonna have a quadratic version so you get your vote is a square root of the amount of ether. So you get small value. So individuals have a lot more vote than people with lots. And, we're, and, and that's the thing is you can select, we isolate that. So people can program any kind of voting, all the kind of stuff, token voting, any way you want. You can select whatever you canonize, canonize it, however you want to do any of that. So yeah. Cool. Can, Canonizer.com. Yeah. Do you guys have like a white paper, like yeah. media post? Yeah, yeah, there's a white paper there on the front page, and there's a help page that tells you how to use it. Beautiful. And there's an introductory video. I'm gonna to have to check that out. This is maybe I'll read this during the type of instead. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, because what you say again, it, it all comes down to consensus. If you don't have consensus, none of that will work. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because like the word consensus itself, like the way we use it right now, is actually like not consensus at all. Fifty-one percent of people yeah. agree to something is like not actually what the word consensus means. Yeah. <laughs> And, so, and, and they always talk about rough consensus. Right. That means ignore what the little guy wants. Right. And you got to keep track of that. Yeah. That's really cool. Any other any other thoughts that are like relevant to any of the things we've said? Like I said, I know. Like, what's the time? It's like uh, almost eleven. Um, my hope was that this would take as little time as possible, but that we would use as much time as we needed. Um, any other thoughts around like current issues or any you know what we're looking at? Uh, one thing that I noticed is uh, in the drain drop dysfunction, the issuer can claim all of the tokens that are staked. The contributions. Yeah, yeah. And now, after hearing you just you know talk about more of the thought behind a lot of the community stuff, like I understand now more that there's like a you want to build those relationships and, you know, and, and so that like you don't need to enforce. The fact that like those found, those contributions can be returned to the people that contributed them, the contributors. Um, but I, I was thinking that like when I first came across it, it would make sense to enforce that because then you're kind of you you have more of a crypto economic play where anyone can look at a issue that's uh, up and say, hey, I want to see this implemented, and not have to worry about the implications of staking. Uh, a contribution against it because you know right now it can be you know subsumed by the issuer and used for other things. So the idea would be that like you could s like put your money in but not have to worry like if the submission wasn't accepted then you would get your money back type thing. Yeah, so you're you're not contributing to an issuer directly. You're basically just contributing to seeing something get it. So 
this is a really good, like, this is kind of like the thinking behind why, so I'll give you guys just some more background in case you're curious. So basically there's a contract or a function in the contract which allows the issuer or the creator or the controller really of the bounty to take all the funds out at any given moment. Um, and the reason for having this function was that uh, at any given moment, if they wanted to, they could like civil attack the contract, create a new address, create a submission, accept their own submission, and drain the money out that way. Um, and so we said, well, if it's going to be possible, we might as well make it possible in like a simple and easy way. That way everyone can see, hey, they withdrew it versus like, mm -hmm. wait, hold up, why is there all these weird new submissions from new users out of nowhere? Like, and that, that, that confusion would just like kind of hinder the, the effort. Um, and so I guess my question for you is like, you know, it, imagining that like a third party could contribute and it would only go to the, like, it's sort of like not under the purview of the issuer, you still sort of need the oracle, right? You need like somebody to say, ah, yes, my contribution should indeed go to that person, ah, yeah. you know? And I'm, the only way to do that is by having each of those contributors be able to be their own oracle if they want it. Uh, but of course that becomes like really time expensive and like ex even gas expensive even because they're always like generating transactions. Have you thought a little bit about like, how that might get solved or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Way to put the script on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Take your time. No, it's like these are just like hard problems. Like, yeah. yeah, they're hard problems. That's why I'm curious because it's like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, that, I, my thinking behind that was like that, 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 that is something that occurred to me. But it, if, if we're able to ensure that uh, that money only goes towards the person who implemented the task, that's like one less thing that a contributor needs to look into. Because um, like obviously you're going to wonder who is able to accept or confirm these things. But that doesn't, that doesn't help me answer your question. Um, I don't really have a good answer. What, what is when like the deadline expires? Like there's kind of like an array of contributor addresses and the values, and you can claim your funds, and then it makes sure that you're not above that value that you contributed. Is that not that's not possible? No, no, no. So right now, yeah, well, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. it's just like the. In the event that, like, even if the deadline doesn't expire, or if it does, like, the issuer can still do that before you. And it kind of really gets to this idea that, like, ultimately, when you contribute to somebody's bounty that they create, thank you guys for joining. Um, that ultimately, like, you have to trust them, you know, and that, like, your money is at their mercy, whether it's because, like, basically because they're the oracle, um, and that instead of like trying to assume that we like can live in a world where we don't trust them, it's better to like face the fact that we trust them, accept that as a premise, and then like figure out how to act in spite of that. Um, but you can't, yeah, going back to what you said, yeah, you can refund contributions after the deadline. Um, the problem is you can't do it before. You can't do it before unless the contributor, unless the issuer does it for you. The issuer can also trigger refunds. So this is the other thing, is that the issuer can, if they're like altruistic, say, refund all the contributions, don't send the money to me, yeah. send the money back to everybody else. And that also is, is there. And so, um, yeah, it is, it is possible. We just try to make it like as generalized as possible. That way, like, if the issuers are honest, they can be honest. If they're dishonest, well, at least they'll be dishonest in the open, which at least makes it easier for everyone to know they were dishonest. Yeah. Um, and that, that, like, you know, that's like the, the best we can do. But um, yeah, that problem of like, you have to trust the Oracle and like you're kind of at their mercy remains like, seems to remain there and, and one that like, I think about a lot and, and trying to get around. But maybe there's like some arbitration solution there where the group kind of votes or, or you know, if there's like, a, if they you know, are bad actors, maybe that's when they come in. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, certainly good to think about it. We've kind of gotten around that as uh, integrators by basically making the contract that we're using to integrate with you guys uh, as the jumping off point for a lot of the functionality within the DAO that exists. So um, basically, we, um, the, the function that allows like uh, the refunds and whatnot to be stuff like that within the DAO. Right, so everything is controlled by the DAO, and so you know it's not like a user's address that can just do it at any point. Exactly. And, and in theory, if it's a contract, they can not have the ability to call the drain function, which like sort of guarantees that they're right. altruistic, right? Which was something we deliberated over a lot. Yeah. Um, and and uh, like we went out of our way to ensure that there was no way for like alternate uh, arbiters or uh, People who approvers, approvers yeah, to yeah, be yeah. added in addition to this contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's like a that's a really good solution or like a 
better than what we have solution, at least. Um, yeah, because then you can kind of abstract that away and, and then and trust the like parent contract. Yeah, so you can just tell people to figure out a way to arbitrate within their own community. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and not to, not to show Aragon again, but like the use case where you're talking about for the arbitration in the community, that works really well with what we want to do with people getting like community tokens for completing the boundaries too, because then that will become like your white list of, of community arbit arbitrators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like you already, it's like right now, I don't know if there's like, there would be a clear mechanism besides just like looking at like, the history of who has like, won the boundaries, but if people actually have the tokens of the DAO, um, then they can be like the first people that, you know, we access to resolve these things. So this is something that we were talking about, like what, what our roadmap for Aragon is, because like I said, there's like the court, um, but yeah, we want to at least like think of the use case of how, how you do like the, the internal, like whatever conflict resolution before you take it. So that's definitely like on our roadmap to build, and maybe it can connect with this other simpler thing that you're gonna have this weekend. <laughs> Can I ask a question about that? Like, it, it just seems like if you have like this sort of Aragon community and they're sort of the issuer of the bounty, you know, then they sort of get to, you know, it seems like if the community is the issuer, it's like a smart contract essentially that's issued the bounty and so they can kind of choose, you know, who to give the bounty to already. So then if, if they're also sort of like the court, like couldn't, couldn't they just issue the bounty? And if, if they choose as a community to not issue the bounty, if you go to them as like a court, like how is that really different? Well, well what, what you were saying before is you, you put a bunch of money in the bank and you say, our community has these values, this, that, and that. If we um, break our rules, then you can take some of the money that's in this other pot here. It's a bit separate than the bounty, but it's like probably sufficient <coughs> capital that it's greater than any one single bounty. Right, right but who, like, who's the oracle? Like if you use... The but yeah, no, but, it's but like, it's like if you use like the Aragon court, no, 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 then it's like separate no, from the community. No, no, or, you no, know, no, like, no. <laughs> in this case, it's like the community. Like, that's the first step. Is, right. It's like community members, they resolve it. So like, you track who has been accepting, who has been working on bounties. You build like this relationship with the community, and then the people who have been like, you know, earning the bounties. So it's probably not just like one person that's working for that community. So it's like all the people that are like working on the, the tasks will be the ones that can resolve things. You just like have to use your human relationships first. Not that we're all random Ethereum addresses like claiming bounties. That's just like not how um, it will work. At least in the context of a DAO. I'm not sure in the context of like all illustrators or like uh, doing it like uh, based on like expertise because those people, you know, they might not know each other as well as if you're working as like part of a DAO. Uh, I actually have to. I want to go to get see Amir Poppy talk. Please, a friend. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but kind of to stay here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for joining us. Yes, it great. Did, to your, sorry, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I was really excited about you talked about this, um, but um, is the problem with using, like, Kinaros uh, or something, that they're, like, they don't have the context to support for the community? Or, like, are there other issues with just, just using them because it feels like they're intended to solve, like, um, this sort of issue? Like, so, if you have some criteria about the, uh, and it's a question of, like, if yeah, so I think the context is like part of the issue. I think they're like trying to solve that issue with regards to like having specific like subgroups within Claros which are like um, uh, like specialists in different areas. Um, you know, I, I, I think like my main issue with Claros stems more around like the nature of how that list of arbiters is derived and that it's sort of like any, it's like plutocratic literally, right? And so anyone can, and they have some randomness, which like helps to avoid it, but um, ultimately like you can still like civil attack, so to speak, in, 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 with your money. Um, and then that's just like not a sound mechanism. We know that plutocratic voting is just like really not good um, and leads to a lot of really big issues. Vitalik wrote about this like three years ago and people are still doing it. Um, and so, and I have like, you know, I've shared this with them, and they kind of seem very steadfast in, in proving it out. And so, like, maybe, maybe Vitalik's wrong, and like, that that does happen, I'm sure, sometimes. Um, but yeah, my main issue is with the, the plutocratic nature of how they derive that. Um, to your point, I think it's like a really interesting question. I've thought about it like a tiny, tiny bit, and so I'll give you like what my gut tells me, yeah. which might be the wrong answer. But 
Um, it seems to me that like any DAO, for that, for a DAO, for you to be able to like open claims against a DAO, yeah. that DAO needs to be part of like a parent community of like a, a DAO of DAOs, so to speak. Right. And that DAO of DAOs would be the arbiters. And so, like, if I, like, let's say it's like, there's like the Aragon community, right? And Aragon right. community posts a bounty, they don't accept my submission, and I say, well, the Aragon community is lying to me. I would go to like the DAO of DAOs, which manages like, the reputation of the entire group, whose incentive it is to maintain their their parent organization kind of reputation, and they wouldn't have their own arbiter list. And so the key is like you sort of like go one step up the tree for any whether it's an individual, you go to their community. If it's a community, you go to their like parent community, and you like kind of trust them to resolve it. Um, Claros is kind of like the parent communities are trying to be with the parent communities of all parents right. um, by using plutocratic kind of mechanisms to get a membership list. I think you get a membership list with like curation, practically speaking, uh, but like by having the in-group curate itself, um, where that DAO of DAOs like would itself curate. Okay, well, like eight out of nine of us think Aragon no longer espouses our values; they don't align with us. Like we're going to kick them out of this DAO of DAOs. So, so would it just like would the mechanism be different in terms of like the, the dispute resolution process? But it would just be using like the token of the, of the holders of the DAO of DAOs instead of like the Claros token, or would would there be a different process? So I think the, the key is like for Claros, and I, I like, yeah. maybe this has changed, this is like based on my best understanding. Um, I know Claros, the way they come up with the list of arbiters is that like token holders vote, you like apply to be an arbiter, and then the token holders vote on whether or not you should be accepted within the list. Um, my view on curation is that instead of having like token holders vote on the list, you should have the list vote on itself. And that like people with who are in arbiters within the list will say like, we, this new arbiter applied. Like, do we think he agrees or she agrees with like what? Yeah, we I, I don't think that's how Claros works. Just Claros works that you you have like a Claros token, mm -hmm. and and then basically you you sort of stake that, right? You mm -hmm. you, you basically lock it up, mm -hmm. and then you're given based on the amount you've staked, mm -hmm. then you get sort of a proportional chance of being selected to is, work. Is there no curation mechanism for who can stake them to begin with? It's open. Like anybody, anybody, anybody can buy these Claros tokens. Yeah. And then based on the percent, like the amount of Claros tokens you have, that's your percentage of being selected as a jury member. Sure. And that's it. There's no curation. They're using it to curate lists, you know. But but yeah, right. there's no curation to be like a juror. A juror. Anybody uh, can just like go and be a juror. Stick. That's like yeah. even worse than I thought. So um, so, you, so you just like. Yeah, so you can, but... So who determines that they lose their stake? So it, it's an economic game where it's like, supposedly, like, the jurors are chosen at random and don't know each other, and if they vote against the majority decision, then the total okay. stake is get taken away. Oh, so if they're not in the majority... So, so, so basically, they sort of, you know, it's sort of this economic, okay, you look at the evidence and you go, you know, what do I believe everybody is going to vote for when they do like a reveal? And, you know, so you're, you're sort of incentivized to vote honestly or you lose your money. Or, well, that assumes that the majority is already honest. I know. Which is and, the hard and part. I, I'm, I'm oftentimes the majority is right and I'm some new minority guy. And so, so I'm not going to stay stuck. I, I, mean, I mean, it, it definitely has some, some, some issues like you bring up in terms of like, you're voting for what you believe is like the popular opinion, not necessarily like to your heart, um, because there is this economic game. Um, also, just yeah. like, I, what worries me about it the most is like, it doesn't, it, like the richest person wins. Yeah. Like the richest person has the most share of votes. And like, do you want to live in the world where the richest people in our world determine like what is right or wrong? I certainly don't. And like, isn't that why we're here in the first place? Like. You know, so um, yeah, that's like a little worrisome to me. I maybe they're right, maybe they're onto something, but um, I think as time goes on, um, people will start to realize like, wait, this that probably doesn't make as much sense as we thought. Like, I mean, I mean, obviously it's very interesting if you can get like you know like civil resistance identity or this type of thing. But even if you sort of have like a, a community in a DAO, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have token holders in in that DAO, mm -hmm. and you might have sort of like some rich token holders in that DAO, and would they not, you know, in any sort of dispute resolution process, be like um, have like a higher weight if they have more of these DAO tokens, essentially? So this is kind of what I mentioned earlier about the idea of like DAOs curating themselves. Yeah. That like 
for instance, if you look at like Wallet Down, right? When you yeah. want to join Wallet Down and buy the tokens, you have to apply to buy the tokens, right? right. And you have to like apply to join. Yeah. And so that can itself be a civil resistance mechanism, whereby like any DAO is like this is a list of people we know are real people. And you have to apply to become one of them. You can't just buy the token on the open market and that gives you membership. No, you have to like try to enter and that group determines whether or not you are a real person. And so from that, you can have, like different people can have different amounts of tokens, but that can be independent of like whether or not they're on like a membership list and have been like civil verified. And if they are civil verified as like, or as like real people, practically speaking, um, within some context, that is civil resistant. Like that is a civil resistant list. Yeah. And so it's like civil resistant lists curating themselves um, from like a community level. Uh, to me, at least, seems like a better way of doing it than because then at that point you don't need to worry about plutocracy. You've kind of like solved civil resistance right. at a community level. Yeah. So so, so then you you just think you would just do like a, a private vote in terms of like just anybody who's on the list can just vote. Yeah. And, and you just keep it private, and then you reveal, and then that's the decision. Then... Exactly. I mean, like the, you could do. There's like interesting stuff around the voting, like the the actual steps, like yeah. having like a command and then a reveal, sure. and, you know, yeah, like, yeah. is like good. But then at the same time, you want to have information sharing, and you want to incentivize people to share their ideas early. Um, and this is actually some weird thing we experimented with Delphi. Was like you commit, and then the order in which you commit determines how much you get. But it's like this like weird recursive way of getting the payout. So it's like, uh, like first I would get like one over n of the total reward, and then the next person would get one over n of the remainder, and so so on and so forth. Uh, and what n is would have to depend on how many arbiters you expect to have voting on that thing. But ultimately, the result would be that um, after I voted, after I've committed my vote, it's in my best interest to share why I voted the way I did, even before I reviewed. And so, like, because you do ultimately want people sharing like their different perspectives. People do. People are wrong sometimes. They don't have perfect information. We should assume that. Um, and so, having like the whole point of having a group vote, the whole point of like why we call it Delphi was what it's called, like the Delphi method. Uh, the Delphi method is like something that's existed for like 20 or 30 or 40 years, uh, and it's actually a way that like companies like do finance forecasting. Um, basically, you get like a group of experts. They in, uh, they independently like come up with their own ideas. They come together. They share those ideas, and then they go separate again, and then they vote. But the key is they like did an initial vote. They like came to their own ideas. Then they come together and share why they why they thought that, and then they and then they separate. Um, but the, and that's like a really interesting tool for like the actual process of the vote. Uh, but with regards to like who can be a voter, I think like those self curating groups, uh, and then just having within those groups people opt in, right? Like if I'm one of the arbiters, but you know there's some like uh, 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 arbitration lawsuit or something about like maritime law, and like I'm an expert in corporate law, but I don't know shit about maritime law. I will opt out to do that because I know if I rule incorrectly and like my peers within that group see, hey, Mark keeps voting on things we know he doesn't know anything about, he knows he doesn't know anything about, like we're gonna kick him out. Right. And so it's like you have the group curating itself and like constantly like getting rid of like viruses as like people really. Um, and like you have like and, and that like opt-in idea, you know, of like where people only like they opt in to do the things they know they're good at. Um, to me, seems like a, a pretty okay solution. If it's civil, if it's civil resistant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is the list a TCR or a um, No, so it wouldn't even have to be a TCR, right? Like this was actually Dean Eidemann, a, T a token curated registry. Yeah, this is what Dean Eidemann suggested because he hated TCR so much. He's like, stop doing this because TCRs assume that like token holders curate the list. Um, and what he said and what we were talking about is like lists curating themselves. And then, you know, if you guys ever watched the TV show Survivor, right, you have like the tribe votes and like you are no longer in our tribe, like you've been voted out of the tribe. And it's that idea of like the group decides whether who stays, who enters into that group and who leaves. It's not some like third party group of people who have a lot of money uh, or who like hold governance tokens or anything. It's like we are the group, we decide who is in our group, whether it's admitting new people or kicking people out. So it's one person, one vote? Uh, you could have one person, one vote. Yeah, you could have like, uh, based on the amount of time you've been in the community, you might be able to get more votes. Like, there's tons of different mechanisms you could like experiment with. Uh, but when you have, because the key is that list just becomes like a civil resistant list of membership. Then you could do like one person, one vote. You could do like, based on your history of like how often you vote, maybe you should get more votes because you're like an active voter. Uh, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want to disincentivize. Like, like, there's so much experimentation. I, I don't know the right answer. 
Um, but the key, the cool part is like the civil resistant list. Because then you don't have to worry about the token balances or anything. You can start to know that like these are real people, that the, and the group knows that they're real people. And if the group starts letting in fake people, the sort of they know that the integrity of their group goes away. Um, and, and, and I think this gets into a really interesting point of like how we see high quality people in the world come together is that they sort of like coagulate together. High quality people want to be around other high quality people. Um, and they will do the work it takes to make sure that the only people they hang out with or spend their time with are other like smart or talented people. They don't want to be associated with people who are crappy. Um, and this is one of the big problems with TCRs was like, if you were on a, like, a, like a restaurant, on a TCR of restaurants, uh, like there could, another crappy restaurant could be promoted above you by the token holders and by association because you were on the same list together, your reputation might go down because the TCR's reputation goes down and you were on that TCR. And so it would like, and it would like drag you down. Um, but alternatively, if those restaurants on that list were the ones curating it, if the restaurants decided among themselves which was the best restaurant, you don't have to worry about food critics coming in and tasting your food, whatever. The restaurants themselves know, like, who is the best. Um, and then I, I think at least that's like a much better path than this plutocratic voting. Again, like we haven't experimented with it, we haven't had the time yet. Um, I'm hoping maybe Claros will realize maybe they were a little wrong and like we'll try to experiment that way eventually um, if, they, if they have enough time left over. So those are my thoughts on that. Please. When you think about what makes an arbiter, what is an arbiter, and that's people who trust you. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what we formalize the canonizer by with an infinite delegation system. So when you come to a topic, I, my kids can delegate to me, I can delegate to my friend who knows more than me, my friend knows world class experts. So you get these high trees. Mm -hmm. and it's, so it's infinite delegation, but it's also real time. So Vitalik gets this huge tree, but if, if Vitalik ever screws up, everyone can instantly jump to some other. Right. And so you just have to formalize what's the business of everything and then track and measure it. Yeah, and then it becomes really expensive to do on chain. <laughs> I assume. I mean, I don't know. I assume. I like this gas is really like. Well, so when you do all of the consensus building and everything on on off chain, off chain, then you can use chain, and then that becomes the oracle to drive the stuff on the chain because the chain can say we're going to use this particular canonizer algorithm to make the decision, and so everyone joins and makes these trees, and we're going to use quadratic ether voting. And so that gives the people in the tree, the small people, as much vote as the people in Luxembourg. And, and then you determine at a time, X, Y, Z time, we're going to make this decision. And so you're watching the tree form and everything, and someone screws up right before, so everyone changes to another person. The vote happens using the desired canonizer algorithm, whatever it is, token holding, whatever you decide. And then that becomes the oracle, and that becomes the enforcement of the and chain. Yeah. We do the consensus thing on the chain, that becomes the oracle to drive. Any other thoughts? It's now 11 17. Um, the sun is shining up there. Then it seems like our conversation has come to like a natural conclusion. Um, thank you guys for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you guys. Um, I don't know a lot of your faces here. I'm Mark. Uh, if you've seen around the conference, like I love talking about this stuff, as you guys can tell. Um, if you have any ideas of like what we should be working on, what you guys want to work on, and maybe we can help. Uh, whether you know, I work at Consensus. Consensus is great. They fund our project. Um, and so, if you guys need funding for your project, maybe I can help give some advice on how you can, how you can get that. Um, but yeah, thank you guys.